Hey everyone, my name is Karen Iwachow. I am the environmental technician and land manager for TLC and today I am going to share with you a small presentation on Fort Shepherd Conservancy area. Uh, this is a beautiful 2200 acre property up in the West Kootenays and well, let's get started. So just a little bit about TLC before we head into Fort Shepherd. Uh, if you don't already know, uh, we are a provincially based, not-for-profit charitable land trust. Uh, we focus on protecting landscapes, which are home to important historical, cultural, scientific, scenic, and compatible recreational values. Um, we love our dedicated members and donors, and they help us do the work that we do here. Uh, yeah, so our office is based in Victoria, and we are a team of seven awesome women. And this year we're celebrating 24 years of conservation. So TLC has three programs, uh, three major programs that we run, and those are uh, conservation covenants, education and outreach, and acquisition. Uh, this is a map that shows where all our protected areas are um, throughout the province. Um, about 15% of them are actually open to the public. But of those, there are some amazing places. And uh, if you want to learn more to figure out where you want to go and check those out, just uh, go onto our website, conservancy.bc.ca. So Conservation Covenants is where I spend most of my time doing my work. Um, we have about 243 registered covenants now. Um, I'm hesitating there because there's uh, just a couple that are just about to be signed off this year. So we'll have a few new properties uh, added to our uh, portfolio, which is really, really exciting. Um, so right now uh, it's protecting about 5,200 uh, hectares and that's about 13,000 acres across the province. And like I said before, um, about 50% of that is on public lands. So we have uh, two educational programs. Uh, one is our week-long intensive uh, called Deer Trails Naturalist Program, and that program runs uh, just outside of Wells Great Park in the Clearwater River Valley. It's stunning up there, and we uh, spend a week off the grid uh, with some awesome uh, seasoned naturalists like Brenny Penn, Trevor Goward, and Nancy Turner, and participants spend a week learning about nature and our the, uh, the natural world where we, you know, live in, and, and, and it's a really, really profound experience. I highly recommend it. Um, if you want to learn more about that, check out our website. Uh, dear, or sorry, so now, um, yeah, our other program is Passport to Nature. Uh, this presentation is part of that. Uh, it's uh, free events throughout the year, and this year's online, thanks to COVID. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, just different topics, um, everything from my being mushrooms to learning more about properties to uh, medicinal herbs and yeah, lots of things. So it's changing every year. Um, so keep tuned. So our last program is uh, the acquisition program. So through uh, purchasing lands, we have nine properties across the province. And so that protects about uh, 3,000 acres on top of of our 13,000 that we have with our covenant program. Um, it's another great way to save land, um, though we know <laughs> land prices are getting pretty expensive these days, but it's no match for dedicated uh, folks who are committed to saving these places. Um, our most recent acquisition is actually um, Susquenum, which is Halibut Island. It's on the Salish Sea, just among the Gulf Islands there. and. Um, it's a nine and a half acre island and it's just a total ecological gem and will be given back to the uh, traditional uh, owners um, of the uh, Lasanic uh, Leadership Council to uh, ensure that that stewardship and protection is in you know good hands and we're very very proud of that work. Here we are at Fort Shepherd. Let's take a look. So for our very brief history of Fort Shepherd, um, I want to say that this is uh, the territories of the Sinink First Nation as well as the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Um, for our colonial history, uh, the property is connected to both the Duny Trail and the Hudson Bay Company. 
the Hudson Bay Company had their uh, trading fort there. Uh, they built in 1858. So um, this was a hot spot for folks to come and trade. Uh, it was also the route along the uh, Kootenai uh, Gold Rush as well. Um, so the uh, fort had actually burned down in 1872 um, and now is uh, a lot more forested than these photos show. Um, but uh, there's just still that carn sitting there. Um, and you can actually hike to this area and take a look at that. There's also a couple other features throughout that forest that you will find um, kind of uh, remnants of, of the fort as well. Uh, this land was owned by uh, Tech Metals for, for, for a long time. And um, back in 2007, the uh, Trail Wildlife Association, a local uh, conservation and hunting group, um, brought the attention to Fort Shep or to <laughs> TLC about Fort Shepherd that this area um, was uh, proposed to uh, turn into uh, I think a, wi or not a wildlife corridor but a highway corridor uh, <laughs> which is not what the wildlife wanted um, so they approached TLC and together um, we uh, acquired uh, this 2200 acre property um, as like a split receipt under the Ecological Gifts Program from Tech, and uh, now we have it protected for its ecological, uh, historic, and recreational um, integrity of the area. So Fort Shepherd Conservancy Area is a property with outstanding ecological and historical features, uh, running more than eight kilometers along the west side of the Columbia River. Uh, the acquisition of this property protects the ecological, historic, and recreational integrity of the area. Uh, with the largest intact uh, of very dry, warm interior cedar hemlock uh, in BC, this property is ecologically unique. Um, the dry, rocky slopes contain crevices that shelter endangered or threatened wildlife, including canyon wrens, Townsend's uh, big eared bats, and um, racers, which are species of snake. Um, as many as 29 uh, rare species of uh, of wildlife have been found or expected to live on the property and during the winter the property is home to deer and elk as the open bench lands provide critical food and shelter. Um, as part of our management plan refresh, um, just something that you do every 10 years or so, um, we have contracted uh, a wildlife biologist to update those uh, lists and I have some cool photos to show uh, of the animals that we found later. So today I'm just going to share a couple projects that we're doing at Port Shepherd. Um, my favorite one is the engineered wildlife trees, uh, just because I learned so much about this. Just super curious. Um, Port Shepherd uh, is downstream from a very large smelter that had been um, raining down uh, some acid rain for many decades. Um, there's scrubbers in those smelters now, so they're... Um, no longer uh, raining any acid, but uh, the impacts are still um, very, very evident at Fort Shepherd. Now, the first thing you notice when you go there is that the soils are really, really shallow and crusty. And when you step on them, uh, you just you just expose the sand uh, below, which is what most of the substrate is at Fort Shepherd because it's the banks of um, the Columbia River. And the other thing you notice is a lot of petrified trees. And this is cool because I learned that in order for a tree to actually decay and fall down, you either need wind or some, you know, weather to forcibly actually push it down or fungal uh, supporters. And so when you got lots of acid rain, that pretty much kills any, any fungal or mycelial um, networks and, and communities there. So we had to reintroduce those back into the system. So this is done by a professional. Uh, so we contracted um, a company that actually uh, specializes in creating wildlife trees. And it's a big process. Um, so you have to uh, find out what are the natural species that are occurring in the area and take those species back into the lab and inoculate them into cedar dowels. Then you go back out to the field and you select your trees that um, you feel be best suited for uh, to to become a wildlife tree, 
and you start working on it. And so in these pictures here are uh, trained arborists in, in making wildlife trees. So it's not only that you have to drill a hole and put the dowel in full of that uh, inoculated uh, fungal cedar dowel, um, you actually have to make the tree look like um, it's decaying as well because not only you have your fungal uh, participant there breaking the tree down, but you have animals that help break the tree down as well. So without those visual cues, uh, woodpeckers can't come and, and, and participate. So um, these arborists are uh, topping the trees, um, making that, that cut at the, you know, at the halfway point of the tree. Uh, jagged so it looks like it snapped off. They're taking some branches out. They're scuffing up the bark with, uh, to expose uh, the trunk underneath and those are the things that are drawing in uh, insects and, and birds and, and animals to help uh, participate in creating these wildlife trees. And so with our partners at uh, Trail Wildlife Association and the Okanagan Nation Alliance and the Indigenous Guardians Program, with uh, funding provided by the Columbia Basin Trust and the Environmental Damages Fund, we now have 40 wildlife trees and we're working on bringing some more. So we have a bird box program at Fort Shepherd. Um, so we've uh, built uh, several dozen uh, bird boxes for uh, mergansers and wood ducks and um, woodpeckers um, and bluebirds. Um, however, I just learned this spring, uh, one of, uh, Kootenai Conservation Program's stewardship series, uh, that, uh, Lewis's woodpeckers actually don't really like to go in the bird boxes, but they actually prefer the hydro poles, those big wooden hydro poles on the hydro right of ways, uh, which we have quite a few, uh, running through Fort Shepherd, so maybe they're taking advantage there instead. Um, but these uh, bird boxes help uh, give some habitat opportunities for uh, the birds um, at Fort Shepherd since, uh, as I was saying in my last slide, uh, some of these wildlife trees aren't ready yet for them to come home. So we have an extensive um, planting uh, native uh, species program at uh, Fort Shepherd, and this is done through um, our collaborative partners who are dedicated to Fort Shepherd. Um, from the Kootenai Native Plant Society to uh, the Trail Wildlife Association and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Um, over the last five years, they've um, uh, spent time at Fort Shepherd uh, planting some native species that are uh, desperately needed. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Fort Shepherd had experienced uh, acid rain from the smelter upstream, so the soils right now are pretty fresh, very shallow. Uh, not a lot of the native uh, plants survive through that period, so we're reintroducing them to provide opportunities for, you know, our, our pollinator and insects and birds and and uh, other animals who call this place home can can have more opportunities to forage from. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it comes with some challenges. Uh, Fort Shepherd's been experiencing some really high temperatures um, the last couple summers, especially this summer, where we've had uh, over 40 degrees there. Um, when you have that kind of weather and, and fresh plants, uh, you actually have to go and water them, otherwise they dry out, and it's a lot of work to see uh, desiccate. So uh, Al, or Al Millett, our uh, volunteer steward at Fort Shepherd, uh, spent all summer um, getting up early in the morning to water these plants and um, I don't have his numbers yet, but we saw something like uh, last year of 80% um, survival rate, which is really, really great. So we really love Al and uh, his commitment to making sure these plants stay alive. Um, there's more opportunities. Uh, we're still planting. So if you're up in the area and want to uh, help out, um, definitely join us. Give me a shout. Um, just want to tell a really interesting story about these uh, seeds that Valerie collects. She does them by hand, actually, and uh, these ones she collected uh, across the river. So in that picture on the left there, you can actually see the other side of the river. So she she picks seeds um, locally so that she knows the genetics are viable for that, that climate and that they'll do well. Um, another thing she does is she collects them from bear poop. and. Um, this is fun. I want to tell every single kid this, but uh, a lot of seeds um, have like uh, a resinous or a waxy coating 
that sticks on them and um, once you know they go through a fire or they go through an animal's uh, system that coating gets removed or scratched up and that gives them the signal to go hey let's grow so um, when you pick that out of some poop you, you save yourself the entire afternoon of you know collecting these thousand seeds when they're just all piled up for you right there um, Really, really great uh, way to collect seeds, but also a really cool way that animals uh, support systems, ecosystems in their own way by spreading these through their poop. Speaking of wildlife, uh, let's take a look at some of the wildlife we've captured on our cameras. We have a pretty extensive wildlife uh, camera network at Fort Shepherd. I think there's over 20 cameras hanging up around um, and our stewards are um, collecting that data and, and taking a look at uh, the habits and, and where these animals are hanging out so we can uh, put together a study to take a look at the health of these animals. Um, uh, anecdotally, the hunters who've been using this uh, area for, for the last um, generation or so uh, have noticed that the animals, uh, ungulate species, have decreased and we don't know why that is. We don't know if that's the case of um, the habitat um, just health is not supporting them or um, you know the climate's not the greatest there or they're just moving on to, to different pastures less disturbances um, and that could be because Fort Shepherd had been experiencing lots of um, motorized uh, vehicle use in, a, in um, up until about four years ago now but um, yeah so we're putting together we're using this data to help put together um, a focus study on taking a look at what those species are doing so we can inform our management plan and future decision making at a responsible way. But uh, we don't only find uh, ungulates uh, on these cameras, we actually are seeing a couple of snaps of um, bobcat, which is this guy here, or gal, I can't tell the gender. Uh, we have coyotes and lots of black bears. Um, there's been reported um, sighting of one grizzly bear, which would be uh, really incredible because it hasn't been one in a long, 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 long time. Um, but there's a couple of sows with uh, a couple of cubs hanging around, which is beautiful. And I'm just looking at the bottom corner of this, this, um, this slide here, and it says 27 degrees. That is hot for a bear. So that's our white tail. Um, they seem to be present, but not as many as they used to be. So I'm going to give you a minute here to try and figure out what that is. <laughs> when I first saw it, I thought it was some like drastic, I don't know, medieval creature, but uh, definitely is an otter. <laughs> well, that was fun to find. And this one is uh, not the greatest photo because it was done at night. However, uh, this is an albino raccoon and I learned that these are like one in a million. So the fact that we have one here is pretty incredible and I hope he's having a good time. So uh, Fort Shepherd is also home to elk and I can see I think four elk in this photo. Uh, there's two in the top left corner uh, fighting, and then there's one like dead center in the middle there. Uh, I guess watching or keeping out of it, and then I think I see another butt behind him, but not sure. Anyways, um, usually in these uh, wildlife photos, you kind of see them doing sort of more uh, mundane things, just walking by or sitting down, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool to catch them in action. So sometimes we catch this kind of wildlife at Fort Shepherd. Um, this is an activity that's not permitted here. Uh, we had stopped the use of motor or access of motorized vehicles in Fort Shepherd about four or five years ago in 20, 2017. Uh, and the reason we chose to do this was because we found that users weren't abiding by um, the rules that we set out basically sticking to the roads that um, we had hoped that they would stay on. Um, so when you're taking, you know, your your ORV or, or your ATV or your dirt bike or whatnot off the trail, um, this has damaging impacts to 
um, wildlife that, that live on the ground. And these are um, endangered species that we have at Fort Shepherd, like the common nighthawk, which is not so common, even though it says it's common in its name, but they nest on the ground and they camouflage with the ground because they're very exposed down there to predators. So camouflage is their, is their way of survival. And when you got your dirt bike riding over them in their nests, well, you're harming these guys as well as, you know, lots of other um, endangered species like uh, the rubber boas and skinks and uh, things that we have here. So um, we had to, to close the gates for that, but sometimes they still make it through and we're working very hard with the community to provide that education and, and reduce those um, disturbances. Uh, we actually found in those uh, short five years or so um, that the areas that they had been disturbed greatly disturbed by this type of use has been recovering quite well. So uh, it's really good news. This is a, another um, population <laughs> that is not native to Fort Shepherd and these are wild turkeys. Um, I understand there's only one species of turkey worldwide and I think three or four subspecies. Um, but anyhow, they're not any different than the ones you see on your uh, uh, dining table for Thanksgiving, but um, in the wild, when they can grow in these huge populations or, um, you know, these parties of like 30, 40 birds, and uh, they can be pretty destructive. Uh, we actually had to put some fencing around our uh, uh, pollinator garden plantings, you know, where we're sowing our seeds because they pick them up and take off with them. Um, you know, there's some arguments that say, well, you know, they're just spreading them else elsewhere, but um, overall, they also can spread invasive species, and um, the population was a lot larger when I first started coming into Fort Shepherd. Um, but as we've had decreases in those disturbances by, you know, motorized use and and lots of people there, we're actually seeing some more uh, predators returning to the area, uh, like uh, um, wolf and um, coyotes and uh, a cougar. Um, I think they're 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 doing their part in helping us take down uh, this population because I'm not seeing as many as I used to. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, like I said in the beginning, we work out of Victoria, and, um, I can't make it up all the time, you know, if I could, um, you know, there's nothing like working, uh, together as a community, and, uh, we really, really love our dedicated volunteers and partners to Fort Shepherd, uh, most of all in that photo there in front of that gorgeous, uh, cottonwood that we found this spring, um, is Alamolette and Carriage Betts. Uh, they are our dedicated uh, volunteer um, stewards for Fort Shepherd and they're down there all the time keeping an eye on our plantings and uh, keep and, and downloading the pictures from the wildlife cameras and everything else in between and I um, really really appreciate their commitment to uh, Fort Shepherd um, and I got my big list there of all the other partners we have um, Trail Wildlife Association, Tech Metals, Columbia Basin Trust, Kidney Native Plant Society, the Leroy Foundation, Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, uh, Ministry of Forest, Lands, Natural Resources, and Rural Development, uh, the Indigenous Guardian uh, Program, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance, which is probably cut up by my video here. Uh, so this is just a couple of photos before I close here. Um, this is sent by uh, Ted Ira Warden, um, and this is what it looked like this summer during the uh, smoky. They had a couple wildfires just upriver, um, so this is what it looks like 
with smoky, smoky skies. Uh, so this is um, just a couple photos of the area where the um, Fort Shepherd Carn is. And uh, it used to have a bronze plaque on there, which has disappeared over the years. So we're going to put another one in pretty soon, and hopefully that one will stay. Um, but uh, this is just a couple of photos of the beautiful landscape around it. Um, this is uh, Ponderosa Pine Forest, um, beautiful open understory. And if you're there in the summer and you want to smell something real good, smell a ponderosa tree. It smells like vanilla. It's fantastic. Uh, so these are some snaps of some uh, plants I took this spring, as well as a photo of the larches in the fall. Um, I love larches. They're stunning uh, <laughs> when they turn gold in the fall. But uh, some from the top left there, we have uh, Tiger Lily, um, Queen's Cup, um, a Larkspur, Nika Rose, um, Dogbane, a really nice species of um, a paintbrush I hadn't seen before. Usually they're red. Um, there's my favorite larch and then uh, some bunchberry underneath there. So those are some of the species of flowers you'll see at Fort Shepherd. So you are more than welcome to come visit Fort Shepherd. Um, just have to warn you, this is a place uh, quite close to the border, so there's no uh, limited uh, cell phone um, service. So um, kind of go at your own risk. Make sure you got a safety plan in place. Um, there's no um, facilities there. This is beautiful raw land, so enjoy that. Um, you can access Fort Shepherd from May 1st to October 31st uh, in the daytime. I really don't recommend it in the dead of summer. Again, I said it's like 40 degrees down there. Um, we please ask that everyone uh, travel on foot. You can even take um, you know, a boat from uh, the Beaver Park across the water there and, and arrive by water. Um, again, careful what the, the river is doing. They are regulated by the dams and can get pretty quick. Um, yeah, please be respectful of, of, of the area. It's very sensitive. Pack it in, pack it out. Um, yeah. So the, um, just wanted to give you a little quick page here on how to get to Fort Shepherd. You have to come from trail and, and take a couple of the side roads from there. What actually happens is that you'll park on the, just off the road, there's a bit of a parking area and a big gate. And that gate is for the Fort, uh, sorry, the tech property. Um, so Fort Shepherd is tucked behind uh, tech land. So you actually have to get out of your car and take a hike down uh, the tech access road, which is about five kilometers. Um, you can either walk, ride your bike, or ride a horse to get through that. And then you can access Fort Shepherd from 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 the uh, bottom end of that. So you can always press pause and save these directions. And that's all, folks. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the work we do at Fort Shepherd Conservancy Area, and I hope to see you at the next Passport to Nature event.